I want to get back into one of our top stories that we do continue to follow here. This is the latest on the arrest of a Long Island architect charged with murder in the Gilgo Beach killings. Rex Hewerman, seen right there, accused of killing three of the 11 victims and is considered the prime suspect in the death of another woman. Their bodies bound and hidden in thick underbrush along a remote beach highway. I do want to talk more about this investigation here. Lisa Evers with our Fox 5 New York team has been covering this and of course works in New York there. She joins us now live to discuss the latest on the case. Lisa, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, Josh, and thank you for the opportunity to talk about this. I mean, I can't tell you how much interest there is in this case here in the New York City area, but also across the country, because this has been one of those, you know, the serial killer next door type of stories for many people. And then a lot of questions about how could this go on? How could somebody do something like this and not be caught for more than a decade? Because it goes back to like uh, 2010, 2011, when the remains of 11 uh, people, most of them believed to be women, were found along the shoreline in Long Island. And just to give you an idea, some context, this suspect who you just showed, he was picked up by the authorities Thursday night, a 59-year-old married father of two living in Long Island with his family and then also working as an architect. And so for a lot of people, they were like, wait a minute, this could be any guy you saw anywhere at the neighborhood grocery store, you know, picking up his kids or his grandkids from school, visiting, you know, any type of thing. So he, um, to a lot of people, they were very, very surprised, but they said, you know what, he kept to himself, but that's not uncommon in a lot of suburban areas. But, you know, I think the other thing that's that's been so puzzling to people is, you know, there was a certain mentality and attitude towards these victims initially because they were sex workers. They were advertising as escorts on Craigslist, which at that time was the way that a lot of people um, advertise their services, personal services, if you will, and other services that were not unnecessarily legal, as well as other objects and things that they were selling. So there was an attitude, okay, they were escorts, what's happening, how could this possibly be? They felt that because of where the remains were found in 2010 and 2011, in these bushy air, bushes um, along the shoreline of Gilgo Beach, that they had to be, it had to be somebody who was very familiar with that area. Now there's some big public beaches on Long Island that the um, area is very familiar for, with like Jones Beach, you know, there's state parks, there's major beautiful state parks with a lot of wooded area, but they felt that the person had to be somebody intimately acquainted with this area. Now, as investigators, we're still just learning the very bare minimum about the investigation and, and all of the things that happened, but some of the things that have come out in the court documents uh, as the prosecutors were, uh, you know, were making their case on Friday before the judge, they said that they, they asked for no bail because he's also a suspect in a fourth murder of a fourth uh, young woman. And then, of course, the other thing was some of the evidence that they had that he allegedly used one of the victim's phones after she was killed to taunt her relatives, to taunt her younger sister, who was 16 years old at the time, and the family members. So that's something that, you know, people are people are very shocked by. But there was, you know, this is 2010, 2011. So by that point, really the the technology for locating and tracing telephones, uh, telephone calls that are being made, that type of thing is much more sophisticated. And then what will be fascinating will be the DNA evidence that they have. So uh, supposedly, according to multiple reports and sources, the authorities in the re last couple of months, they were doing as we've seen in so many movies and detective shows, they were actually going through the trash of the of the suspect's home and collecting samples of d different things that they thought could give them DNA samples. So they're saying that they have DNA. Now that will be interesting to find out what kind of match or how they could match with something that that's that is that old because what forensic uh, investigators have told me in the past when we've done crime lab stories and that type of thing is the DNA in some some situations it can be preserved uh, very, very well from the victims and other cases over a long period of time, it is going to degrade and become very difficult to to have some type of match. But the sophistication with which we have DNA, um, you know, which investigators have DNA uh, tracing uh, tracing mechanisms and also ways to isolate various patterns, even fractions of patterns right now is unbelievable. So we'll see what that what comes out of that. But they were actually going through their trash 
uh, collecting DNA evidence from him and his family to see what this is. Now, he pleaded not guilty. Uh, the judge denied the bail request. And as part of that bail request, the prosecutors were like, we're looking at him for a fourth murder as well. So we're, we're really at the very beginning stages of this whole case, Josh. Yeah, and the question that we are hearing from a lot of people, of course, is really just what is it about this case that has captivated so many people? Because this is something that essentially was infamous. It was considered to be long unsolved. It had happened more than a decade ago, but folks still talked about it a lot, especially in that area. What is it about the case that so many people have been paying such close attention to? Well, I think you have to look at the, the, the geography of it, too. I mean, you're talking about communities on Long Island which unlike other parts of the country, you know, mo most of it is suburban. There, there's some areas where, you know, there, there's county offices and that type of thing. But it's also, it's also one of those areas where a lot of people have lived their entire lives. They're born, they're raised, they raise their families, they spend their entire lives there, their re relatives live nearby. The, the communities in many places on Long Island, particularly in that area, tend to be very stable. People feel like they know their neighbors, even if they're not talking with them or going to barbecues with them. They, they know that, you know, they, they know who they are. They've seen them around for years. And there's a certain comfort zone when you see somebody regularly doing the normal things, the regular things that everybody does, you know, going shopping, running errands, mowing their lawn, doing those types of things. So I think that was one factor of it. And then the other factor of it was, you know, you had a couple couple of things happen all at the same time, which was the, um, you know, you, you also had podcasts that came out that drew a lot of attention to it. The fact that there was, and, and still that, you know, more than a decade later after these bodies were discovered of these of these poor young women, the fact that this there's a serial killer on the loose. I mean, that's that's always a thing. You know, in murder, as you know, Josh, there's no statute of limitations on that. So I think you have the geography of it. It's a beach area. You have the the sheer number of of potential victims um, that that's there. It was found in, in an area that many people said, okay, this is going to have to be somebody who knows the area. This is not just like right off the inner. You know, this is not like right off the ramp of off an interstate highway where somebody's gonna drive off and then drive back on. So I think you had that. And then I think the other thing too, is you have, you have in that part of Long Island now, in the, uh, in, the, in the county, you have a lot of investigators who have done extensive amounts of, re of investigative work in New York City as either New York City detectives, as it, uh, with federal agencies here in New York City, with their New York City branches. You also have prosecutors uh, like the prosecutors that, that have come that have had experience. And not to say that it's better if they're coming from New York City, but when you're talking about investigations, you're talking about individuals that are dealing with multiple ongoing investigations simultaneously, a heavy volume and, and a lot of long-term cases. So I think there was, you know, there's been over the last five years, really, an influx of these uh, of law enforcement professionals uh, who live on Long Island, who used to work in New York City, who are now back on Long Island, and they took a look at this, and of course, using modern day techniques and using the current uh, technology, with their, which they're very familiar with, from you know from their experience in the city. I think that played a role a role as well. You know, the Suffolk County Police Commissioner, uh, Rodney Harrison, he is the former uh, f former chief of department here in New York City. The prosecutors, there's a, a lot of people. The sheriff, there's a lot of people there that have extensive, you know, 20 plus years. Uh, working for some of the biggest uh, law enforcement agencies and some of the toughest crimes. And I think they saw it as a challenge as well. I'm sure they had a lot of people in their, in their circles saying, listen, what's going on with this? People are talking about it. And, and I think the podcast, you know, and the, the ongoing news stories and, and some, of the, uh, some of the things on the streaming, various streaming platforms played a role in getting people's interest because here were these young women they, you know, they were sex workers, but many of them had had loving families or families that cared about them. The families never, never gave up. You know, to to their credit, um, on anniversaries and things, they would always bring attention to it, and they kept up the fight. And I think when you have victims' families who are saying, you know, as as we've seen in other cases, Josh, when you have victims' families saying, you know what, we we are not going to rest. We're never going to forget her you know, that was our daughter, that was our sister, that was our cousin, that was our niece. And then the, that really motivates investigators to do everything, absolutely everything that they can. So it's a fascinating case. And I think, I think as we come to, you know, as it progresses and 
we come to find out more about the the various steps and what were the things that that got them to this threshold where they could bring first and second degree murder charges in each one of these three uh, three women's murders uh, that Rex Hoyerman is charged with. That's going to be really fascinating because first degree murder in New York in New York State is very rarely used unless it's for the murder of a police officer or a law enforcement official or with very specific intent. So it'll be really interesting to see um, the details of this as this unfolds in, in the weeks and months ahead, Josh. Yeah, I definitely didn't know that about first degree murder, uh, murder there in New York. But I was gonna ask you, what was most shocking to you? What stood out to you the most about what we've learned over the past several days from let's say court documents related to this suspect here? Well, I think the thing that's most shocking to people is that this is not, you know, we've become accustomed to, okay, we hear of a bank robbery, you know, bank robbery uh, suspect who's hit up six banks. When the person gets, when that suspect gets arrested, uh, newsflash, he's been arrested before. He's had, he's done time for other crimes. You know, there's a, there's a certain, there's a certain pattern of behavior. This is a man who was an architect, which means he had to be licensed to be an architect in New York, New York state. Father of two, people knew him in the neighborhood. His father, um, according to reports, had lived in that same area as well. Uh, and, you know, so people felt, I guess, surprised, I mean, you, surprised, like, okay, this guy, he's just, he's a working man, a family man, living the life that many other people are living. And to have him, to have somebody that could be capable of this kind of a, a diabolical uh, type of crime, I mean, you're talking about these bodies were wrapped up in burlap. They were, that's what, how they were found in the bushes in this beach area and it's it's just it, it's it's mind blowing and then of course there were there were remains so there's a lot of questions too and a lot of information that we still need to find out about what was there can they even determine their cause exact exact cause of death at that particular point were they tortured before they were murdered uh, were they were they sexually abused they were maybe brought into that area um, investor, investigators have said over the years in previous uh, previous investigations that they, that they believe that the women were lured to a particular location because on, on this Craig, Craigslist and the Craigslist predates a lot of the apps, you know, the hookup apps or the the uh, personal services apps. I'll call them that. Um, but the you know, so it was it was a thing online. So I also it, you know, it'll also be interesting to see what kind of online. Uh, traffic they have? Did they go back over Craigslist? There, there had to be payments made um, if they were uh, sex workers. Th so there would be some kind of finance. There had to be at some point, whether the transaction point or the finish point, there had to be some kind of financial uh, records as well. But I think the DNA thing will be the most fascinating. And probably, you know, a lot of prosecutors say that's the one thing that juries really never second guess. If you have DNA matches, between suspects and victims uh, that are that are overwhelmingly, you know, like a 99% plus match between the suspect and the victim, those are usually very compelling to juries, and uh, juries usually will not will not question beyond what the scientific evidence is in those cases. So I think there's just there's just a lot more that we had to find out, and and then also too, if he was living in a home with other people, was there was he where where was he if he is in fact the the uh, killer where was he luring these women to where was he meeting you know where was he meeting them where because at some point he had to meet them and being in a beach area like that you know that a remote beach area unlike being in been in a city or an area where there's a shopping mall and you're going to have surveillance cameras that are set up in parking lots and that type of thing um where where were those places so i i think the actual methods and how it was being done what will be fascinating you know to to find out and and hopefully at the end of all this josh i mean the ultimate goal is that the victim's families will get some peace of mind and some sense of justice if he's found guilty and and also you know the women can rest but i mean it's you know they tell us about serial killers they can do these things for a period of years and then they stop but then sometimes they resurface again someplace else so i just i, I think that this is going to be a uh you know, a, a murder mystery that we're all going to be following very closely for a very long time, Josh. Definitely, for sure. All right, Lisa Evers with Fox 5 New York. I love our conversations. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me and help break down this case. We still have a lot to learn, and I'm sure this yeah. is, as you said, just kind of the beginning.